Welcome, friends, to another Global Capitalism Live Economic Update. This is Richard Wolff, and we are in July of the year 2022. Today's presentation is going to be all one composite presentation, and it's trying to provide an explanation, if you like, for something that I have been hearing in the last two months significantly more often than I had heard it before. I hear phrases like, the world is falling apart, the world is coming to an end, everything is turning bad, I'm scared, and more words to that effect. Yes, yeah, sometimes they're done in jest as a joke, but more often than not, there's a lot of genuine feeling wrapped up in those words. And I guess one way to present what I'm going to offer today is evidence that for those of you who feel that, at least sometimes, you are being very smart, very sensitive, because the world is changing quickly and profoundly, and that's what I want to talk about. And the word I want to use as a kind of focal idea is the word split. Things that used to be together are split apart. Things that you thought were necessarily connected aren't. Alliances are disintegrated. Deals are coming undone. There is, in a real sense, a world falling apart. And it's good that you are frightened and scared, at least sometimes, because it shows you're paying attention. And that's the first step to getting the kind of interventions going that can turn potential disaster into historic opportunity. It will then not surprise you that I'm going to begin by talking a little bit about the war in Ukraine. I am not going to join in the propaganda battles, which is about 95% of what I see. Since I live here in the United States, I get mostly the U.S. version. I don't live in Russia, so I don't get their version, and I don't live in the Ukraine and I don't get their version either. Let me be clear, I am no partisan, neither of Mr. Zelensky and the government in Ukraine, nor of Mr. Putin and the government in Russia. When I look at the two of them in battle, I'm reminded of what Eugene Victor Debs said in the months, years, beginning, moving into World War I when he said that no American working man or woman should go out there and fight, risking death and energy uh, uh, and injury in the effort to kill other working men and women from other countries. We have no beef with them. This is a war of capitalists and businessmen and women and the politicians they control. It's not ours. That's pretty much how I look at the war in Ukraine between Russia and the Ukraine. Not my war, not our war, and I want to develop that thought. But for the very first step, I want to alert you to a split. No, not the split between Ukraine and Russia. That's pretty clear. They're battling each other uh, in the Ukraine. I want to talk about the split between two wars that are actually going on. A military war in Ukraine between the Russian military and the Ukrainian military uh, receiving enormous assistance, the Ukrainians are, from the United States and from Europe uh, in the form of weapons, training, and that's what's publicly known. I'm sure there's much more uh, going on that we don't know about. But there's a second war that goes by the name sanctions. That's when the United States and its allies in Europe uh, put economic burdens on Russia, on individual Russians, on Russian companies, on the Russian government, interfering in all kinds of business arrangements, 
financial arrangements between the Russian Central Bank and the rest of the world, and so on. The sanctions war is a separate war from the Ukraine war. It is sometimes lumped together, but it shouldn't be. And I want to talk to you about that war and what the splits are that are going on. The first one is a split captured by the phrase, the first casualty in every war is the truth. It's very hard to find out what's going on from a reliable source. Somebody not interested in boosting one side against the other and vice versa. I've done the best I can to bring you what I think are reliable bits of analysis uh, to build a story around. Okay. The first is that the people, the government, the economic system of these two countries is both capitalist. Let me explain what I mean. In both countries, most business is organized with a small number of people at the top who are the owners, the capitalists, the board of directors, the ministers in charge, whatever. And they hire the bulk of the people to work there. So you have the capitalist split between employer and employee. That's how most of the goods and services produced in the country are organized. And that's what capitalism is. The only difference, and it isn't very large, between uh, Ukraine and Russia is the proportion. What proportion of the capitalist employers are government officials and what proportion are private. Both countries have a mixture. The proportions are not exactly the same. The proportions are not the same between any two countries in the world. So this isn't all that remarkable. And what is the capitalist problem or the capitalist desire driving the Ukraine? Well, they'd like to be less of the poor Eastern European capitalism that they have been as long as they've been independent. They want to get out of their relative poverty, their relative backwardness, and become an important part of the European economy. In this, they follow Poland and other Eastern European countries. They want to be part of the European Union. They want to have the benefit of the investment flows into their country that that might involve. They want, in short, to choose a path that is good for the capitalism that their economy basically is. Russia has a similar but in some ways different objective. It, too, wants to cash in on the European economy. Its ways of doing that are a little bit different. It is going to rely more on the oil and gas that it has, that a booming European economy has been and was thought to continue to depend on. This was profitable for Russia as the exporter and profitable for Europe as the importer. And likewise, Russia has an understandable anxiety about countries on its borders becoming militarily hostile. And they have had to see that since the end of the Eastern Bloc back in 1989-1990, as Poland and the Czech Republic and other countries on the Eastern European vertical corridor become NATO members or closer militarily and politically to the United States and NATO. And they didn't want the Ukraine to become the, the, the final big stone in that process. So here are two societies with their capitalist agendas and their political concerns. How are they going to work this out? Are there ways that the Ukrainians can develop their capitalist agenda, the Russians develop their capitalist agenda with some security guarantees about their anxiety 
And let's be fair, the Russians were invaded to disastrous consequences twice in the last century and from Middle Europe uh, that they might be concerned uh, about the intentions of a Germany or of a Ukraine or of a possible alliance between them, which we have had before, is neither bizarre nor strange nor difficult to agree with. What has to happen then is a negotiation and a compromise. How can we meet the needs you two capitalist countries have? That was the issue that precipitated the war, the failure to negotiate that process and the decisions made by both sides. The notion that we're going to locate all the bad behavior on one side, either one, is silly. We, it's never true. It's not true this time either. There's lots of blame and responsibility to go around. That's why the demand for negotiations is still the major demand of the world. And I'm going to come back to that. It makes the most sense above all, to avoid the kind of destruction of property and people that is now going on in the Ukraine, and those people are suffering in ways that should never have begun, let alone been allowed to continue. So now let's look at the sanctions. They go, first of all, right to the heart of the Russian economy. When American officials said, and they have done this repeatedly, that weakening Russia is part of what this is about, everybody's eyes and ears perk up because that's what it looks like. Russia is heavily dependent on oil and gas, the fertilizer made from oil. These kinds of materials are crucial to the Russian economy. They have been for quite a while. Everybody knows it. To sanction that, to tell other countries you can't buy it, you can't use it, you must cut off from it. To tell the Germans and the Russians who collaborated on billions of dollars to build a special pipeline for that purpose that they cannot use the pipeline they've already built is an act of economic warfare that does threaten Russia. So, of course, Russia pushes back. That's what happens when you engage in a sanction war, the sanctions begin to flow both ways. You can demonize one of the sets of sanctions and pretend the other ones aren't really bad or aren't really justified or unjustified, but it's beside the point. When you engage in this kind of behavior, it goes both ways. When the United States says, as it does, that the international community is behind it, this is not only inaccurate, but it is deeply offensive in a way that you would have thought the old colonial powers, Western Europe, the United States, and Japan would never again talk like because they are no longer the international community. They can all agree on something. They don't, but they could all agree on something. And that leaves Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And guess what? That's much more that totality, the international community, than the United States and Western Europe. And let's be crystal clear. The international community, understood properly, has been systematically unwilling, crystal clear, to join the United States and Western Europe in its sanction war against Russia. I'll give you just a couple of examples. We'll come back to them later. I think many of you know what the BRICS are. B-R-I-C-S stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These five countries have been working together now for many years. They constitute an important international alliance of countries. But here are some things you should know. Not only is Russia part of this, but all five countries, that is Russia and the other four, are continuing to trade with Russia, are continuing to invest in and with the Russians, are unwilling to side with the Ukrainians, and unwilling to side with the United States and Western Europe. 
indeed, India and China are absorbing much of the oil and gas that the Russians can no longer export to Western Europe, thereby allowing the Russians not only to keep their export income going, but as a result of rising prices of oil and gas, actually earn the money it costs to wage the war, which, to no one's surprise or understand, means that the Russians have much less going on pressing them to end it than they might otherwise. It's important to understand that the majority of countries in Africa are continuing their relationship with Russia and resisting the pressure to do otherwise. The BRICS, those five countries, their population together, 2.3, 2.4 billion people. Excuse me, 3.2, 3.3 billion people, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, way bigger than the populations of the United States or of the United States and Western Europe. That's an important reality in terms of what you can expect from a sanctions war. The reality is that the global footprint, the global power of the United States isn't what it was 75, 50, or 25 years ago. And the biggest change of all has been the growth of China, which is an ally of Russia, and that should not be forgotten. The United States most recently has asked China to be neutral and to support the rules of the international order. Now, I can assure you, since I spend time reading the newspapers and official statements of many of these other countries, these comments coming from the highest officials in the United States and several other countries are greeted with stunned disbelief that slowly morphs into ridicule. The United States invaded Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan. I could go on. What rules of international order enabled that experience of a rich, powerful, military, dominant country to invade and militarily subdue or try to, since none of those wars came out real well for the United States? And I'm being as polite here as the reality allows. No, no, you can't do that and you ask the Chinese to be neutral. The Chinese have sent no military equipment to Russia to support them in this war. The United States has sent about 50 to $60 billion worth of support, and that doesn't add up to or count the German support, the British support, and the other supports Europeans are giving to the Ukrainian side. Who is being asked to be neutral? What in the world are you talking about? There's a split between the United States and Europe on the one hand, and pretty much most of the rest of the world. Maybe not Japan and Australia. There are a few that are allied, but most countries are not. They are splitting from the West in ways we have not seen before. And the war in Ukraine is showing it, exposing it, and deepening it. So if you have a sense of a world coming apart, changing, splitting, Ukraine is a big part of how that is evolving. Let me turn next to splits um, in Europe and around Europe, the ally of the United States from which the United States is splitting in more ways than one. First of all, here are the splits inside Europe that are becoming aggravated. Many, many people in Europe are upset and have been for years that the European Union was a union invented, orchestrated, constructed, and run for employers, not employees. That that's what the European Union accomplished, profitable opportunities, for employers and the ever more difficult problems for employees, harder 
to hold on to good jobs and good wages, harder to hold on to a social services program from your own government under the pressure of competition within the unified Europe. More and more Europeans felt, and they've expressed it from the beginning, that something valuable had been lost beyond what they had been told, beyond what they had expected. Something very nationalistic had been lost, and they didn't want to lose it. That the European Union threatened what was distinctive about French or Dutch or Spanish or Greek national values, national political customs, national cultures. And those splits have not gone away. They have gotten worse. And one of the key reasons, and you'll see this as a theme, is that the economic well-being of the mass of the working class in Europe has taken terrible blows in the first 20 years of this century really the first 20 years of the experiment of a unified Europe with a single currency, the euro, and so on. I'm going to later talk about how a very similar attack upon and suffering by the working class has been true in the United States. But before I get to that, I want to see where the, this has taken the Europeans. It means that they are now seeing the war in Ukraine as more evidence that something is going on that makes them irritable, suspicious, skeptical, that this war isn't really about what the leaders say it is about. And they see huge amounts of money being shifted over to help a small country that most of them have very little to do with and very little feeling for. What you do have is inside each European country, in or out of the EU, a struggle going on, particularly for the last 30 years, a struggle between those who want to advance the capitalist profitability of their economies by being more like the United States and the United Kingdom, by reforming their labor markets, by reducing their social services, by shifting the burden of taxes off of corporations onto individuals, to do in Europe what they see seems to have worked well in the United States. Those people are squeezing the working classes in every one of those countries, and the working class feels it, and the working class resents it. One of the interesting things that have had to be done in the face of an angry, upset, threatened working class is to distract them from the capitalist system that is their problem and has been from the beginning. They need to be distracted if the capitalist system can continue to do what it's been working so hard to do these last 30 years become more profitable, become more like the United States and Britain. Even as the United States and Britain go further and further in that direction so that the rest of Europe is always, in some sense, catching up. What are the distractions? Well, we know them. They're not so different from the similar distractions used here. Part of Europe has been excited beyond words for decades against immigrants. You see the shrinking wage, the shrinking social care for people that is part of the capitalist program in Europe, as it has been, is blamed on immigrants. They are the problem. They cause money to be used in ways that aren't good for the native population. All those kinds of stories. And they are very big in everywhere from Scandinavia in the north to, to Greece and Spain and Italy in the south and everywhere in between. The very problems of capitalism globally producing chaos and masses of refugees coming, you guessed it, to prosperous Europe then produces this kind 
of backlash, which is a distraction, a way to blame something other than the economic system for the problems of the economic system. Here's another distraction. The war. War in the Middle East, war in Ukraine, war anywhere. Now we can rev up the patriotism. We can rev up the hostility to others. The splits between Christians and Muslims can be brought forward, as can other splits, some old, some new. They're useful as ways of distracting and deflecting the suffering of working classes from the system that puts them in that position. And the Europeans are acutely aware of all of this, just like they're aware that the United States and Britain are extreme cases of this, and that therefore following them is a very dubious matter. For example, the British came up with a way of deflecting the anger of their working class, which was more extreme. But that's not a surprise because the British working class, particularly after 2008, was really heavily damaged by the austerity programs of the conservatives in the British government and by the inability of the labor movement, except for the short period of Mr. Corbyn, to be much of an opposition about any of that. And so they had to come up with an extreme distraction. They did. It's called Brexit. They convinced the British people, you know, your problem is the Europeans. We should split from Europe. They did. The British economy has been going down ever since. The condition of the working class going down ever since. It solved nothing. It gave Mr. Boris Johnson, a naughty boy with bad hair, an opportunity to become famous because he galvanized a bitter working class's desire for something to change, and maybe he could do it. Maybe somehow by distancing Europe, by leaving Europe, by splitting from Europe, it could be. There was nothing there. In the famous line, there's no there there. There was no policy. And of course, Mr. Johnson leaves as befuddled and irrelevant to what's going on. Indeed, his parting shot will in the future be understood not to be lying to the British people about the contempt that he holds for them, but rather his excited embrace of the war in Ukraine, almost in a cartoonish way, to get everyone excited in Britain about his solidarity with Mr. Zelensky, etc., as a way of distracting people from the reality of the British economy, which is, and I am not exaggerating, an unmitigated disaster. The Europeans are also smart folks, and they understand they're at a turning point in the world. They know the splits I've spoken of. They're acutely aware of them. And they are aware that the working class they have been squeezing because they felt they had to, to compete with the United States, to follow the United States, but also to try desperately to construct a European capitalism that could play the role in the world that the United States had played. Maybe not be the successor empire to the United States' empire, but at least be a contestant. They haven't been able to do it. They're so needy to distract their people. They're so needy to accommodate the nationalism so that their working class doesn't turn against them, that that same nationalism that saves them condemns them to be unable to become a unified capitalist competitor in the world. And they know it, and they suffer from it. They wonder about two things that I want you to think about, because these splits 
are right below the surface or at the surface, and they are not being attended to, they are not being resolved, they sit there and could explode the thing we call Europe at any time. As I'm going to argue in a few minutes, the splits here in the United States could do as well. In Europe, number one is the following split. The world is more and more breaking down into two major competing capitalist powerhouses. The United States, mostly a private capitalist economic system, and the People's Republic of China, a mixture, partly private, partly state, run by a powerful communist party. State capitalists, employers, hiring employees, so it's capitalist, but with the state occupying the position of employer, side by side with a very large and powerful private capitalist sector, where the employer is a private citizen who does not occupy a position in a state hierarchy or a state authority. So the United States, overwhelmingly private, very little state, China, a mixture. These are the two powerhouses. Compared with that, everybody else is junior. Here's a statistic I've mentioned once before, but it is one of those you need to keep in mind not to lose a perspective on what's going on. The GDP of Russia is one and a half trillion dollars. The GDP of the United States is 21 trillion dollars. It's important to understand, David, and Goliath. The Chinese GDP is about $15 trillion, way more than Russia is or has any prospect of becoming anytime soon. But it is catching up to the United States, and that is expected quite soon, quite possibly in this decade that we are in. So let's be clear. Europe knows exactly what these numbers mean. Europe has to decide who is its best ally. And if you were to follow European business discussions, they talk about that. And they even talk about whether they're making a big mistake hooking up with the United States again on the Euro Ukraine war, among other things, the sanctions, because that makes difficult their relationships with China which is dangerous for them. Just as if they allied with China, that would make difficulty in their relations with the United States. But make no mistake, they are thinking about that, and that's new. They're wondering, they're debating, and there's lots of political support in most European countries for opening that question up. Do not be misled by understandable propaganda that there's a 100% support for the position of the U.S. and the U.K. and so on, apropos of the sanctions against, as I've already shown you, it's not true. And in the lack of truth there, something dangerous lurks, miscalculations based on a misunderstanding of what's going on. It's not at all clear which way these splits will work out. And then a shock when in June, something unique happens for the first time in many decades. The left, typically divided into many little competing groups that undercut one another. The left, which hasn't known quite how to handle the period after World War II, when neoliberalism and globalization seemed to be able to generate rising incomes and jobs, and what were they going to criticize? How were they going to criticize? They weren't even able to hold on to the old social democracy. And so they lost their favor. They lost their political base. The left has to refine a footing, and it's beginning now to do that because it's beginning to be able to say honestly, 
what they couldn't before, that the problems in each of the European countries is fundamentally the capitalist system within them, the pressures of that system on the politicians, the ability of the capitalists to buy the political system, the use of their power and wealth to accumulate more, to make the societies more and more like the British and the Americans at the expense of the very national culture that in other moments those politicians have to support for fear that otherwise the mass anger would turn against them and against the capitalism that puts them into positions of power. So the French had an election unique because the left kind of got it under the remarkable leadership of a left-wing socialist, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, they stood for the legislative elections. A few weeks after the French had voted in, re-elected Mr. Macron as their president, Mr. Macron's party contested for those elections. He needed to get his party to hold on to their majority so he could continue to be the leader. He failed. He couldn't. I want to give you the results of the vote in France by party. The three important parties. There were others, but they got much, much smaller amounts of votes. Here are the big three parties of France. And pay attention because here is a sign of what the splits were, how they are changing, and how they will change European politics. Mr. Macron crashed. He's out, just like Angela Merkel is out and Boris Johnson is out. Mr. Macron crashed. He's not out yet, but it doesn't look good for him. His party got about 38% of the vote, which means that roughly two-thirds of the people of France rejected the party of their sitting president three weeks after voting him back into office. Coming in second at about 32% of the vote, roughly 6% less than the party of the sitting president, was Mr. Mélenchon's left-wing party. Actually, the unified party, including the French Communist Party, the French Socialist Party, the French Green Party, and Mr. Mélenchon's independent left Socialist Party. Mr. Mélenchon has been part of the French far left most of his adult life. Now what about the right wing? The other way that working class anger can express itself when it can't attack capitalism, that's the taboo, but it is seething with displeasure, unhappiness, fear, and anxiety about where capitalist development in Europe is taking them. Well, these are the folks who can embrace the scapegoats, can embrace the distractions. In France, it's the Nationalist Party of Marine Le Pen, of the Le Pen family, which focused itself on being anti-immigrant. In that presidential election a few weeks ago that Mr. Macron won, his opponent was Le Pen. It was the center right of French politics against the far right. And that was, we were told, where politics in Europe was and would stay. And you could cluck, cluck your tongue because it's the far right, but you could feel okay because they didn't do very well. Mr. Macron has repeatedly defeated her with big margins. Well, I'm going to tell you what she got, her party, in the legislative elections. 17%. So let me remind you, the president loses his absolute majority as two-thirds of the French vote against it. The big newcomer, the number two party in France now, by far no one's close to them, is the far left. Coming in almost half the strength of the left is the far right. That 
is a very new world in Europe. And the reverberations of that outcome in France are changing every politics in Europe as we speak. But of course, my guess is many of you are unaware of all of this because the media, particularly in the United States, can't handle any of this and instead wants to talk as though, quote, the international community is all focused on the war with Russia in the Ukraine. It was barely an issue in the French elections. Pensions were the issue. Wages were the issue. Taxes on people, these were the issues. And the left exploded, showing how strong it is and how and why it is a contender for power in France and that is typically referred to as the second most important economy in continental Europe. Okay, I could talk about other splits, part of me wants to. These are important because again, they reflect, they show, they exemplify a world that is changing and doing things no one thought of. In Scotland, there's a serious effort to break from England. Greece and Turkey's problems do not go away. Christian versus Muslim is at work all over, particularly Southern Europe, but everywhere in Europe as well. These splits, in addition to those I've mentioned, are getting worse, and they're interacting with the underlying difficulties of capitalism, both internationally and in each of these countries. Now I want to turn to the splits in the United States, which echo, interact with, and worsen those around the world, hastening and deepening the anxieties that show up when people say, the world is ending, the world is coming to an end. Mr. Trump, as we know, as president for those four years, worsened all of this with his active cultivation of anti-immigrant scapegoating. But as many commentators have pointed out, Mr. Obama did a good bit of that before Mr. Trump and Mr. Biden hasn't stopped it all that well since Mr. Trump. Mr. Biden scapegoats Russia more than China, but scapegoats China too, borrowing and continuing from Mr. Trump. What is going on here is what I want to stress and to talk about the political, economic, and cultural consequences. The American working class was savagely damaged in the Great Depression of the 1930s. From 1929 to 1941, the American working class really suffered. If you have not yet read The Grapes of Wrath, uh, the, this is a book, and there are many others like it, but it will give you a feeling for what was happening to huge millions of American people. Out of that catastrophe came a sharp movement to the left, not to the right. There were movements to the right, absolutely, but they were far weaker than the movements to the left, a little bit like that French election I just spoke to you about. Roosevelt had the support of a massive movement as president in the 1930s from below, a unionization movement, the CIO, mobilizing millions of workers who had never been in a union before, whose parents had never been in a union before, to see in unions a protection against a capitalist system that had abandoned them. And two socialist parties and a communist party who were the allies of that CIO who agitated in the neighborhood, in the school, in the church, in the political arena 
building up ways of thinking about the world, ways of understanding capitalism as the system they lived in that was the perfect match for what the CIO was trying to do in the workplace. The CIO organized you where you worked, and the socialists and communists organized you where you lived. And the two worked hand in hand, and the combination was unbeatable. A cons basically conservative, middle-of-the-road Democrat, Roosevelt, became the exemplar of progressive Democrat to this day because of the pressure from below, and he would not have been able or even interested in doing it if there hadn't been that pressure from below. And so wages didn't go down as much as they might have. The inequality in this country shrank during the 1930s. Very atypical and unusual. The government arrived with programs for the mass of people, as I have told you on occasions before. The social security system, the unemployment compensation system, the first minimum wage, and a public jobs program. Massive, expensive programs produced by a government in the midst of the worst depression capitalism has yet seen. And how was it paid for? By taxing and borrowing from the rich who had nothing they could do to stop it. And they suffered. That's why the inequality of wealth and income took such a dive. But when the war was over, and this is crucial, when the war was over, a war characterized not only by the rise to power of the left in the United States in the 30s, but the alliance with Russia, Soviet Russia, against fascism in Japan and Germany. When all of that was over in 1945 and the president was dead, began the reaction, the undoing of the New Deal. And that is crucial to understand the splitting of the world now. A new world was arranged at the end of World War II. The United States became the global dominant empire. It replaced what little was left of the French and the British and the other empires. The dollar became the global currency more than it had been. The International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, all kinds of institutions developed to organize, impose, monitor, and control a global economy in which the United States was absolutely dominant. And right from the beginning, with the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, the assault on the working class to undo all it had achieved in the 1930s began. The Taft-Hartley Act made it illegal for a communist to be the head of a union. It required that anything won by a union at a workplace be provided to all the workers there, whether or not they joined the union, whether or not they paid union dues. In other words, you created the free rider system in a society which rejects it everywhere else, but not if it can weaken labor, which is what, of course, it was designed to do and did. Communists were converted from the advance guard of all of this process, the vanguard that helped do it, into evil agents of a foreign power. That got rid of them. Then you followed by getting rid of the socialists. And it was explained to the American people, many of whom still believe this, that a socialist and the communist are the same thing. They just spell these words differently. And then you went after the labor movement and over the next 30, 40 years, crushed it. And by doing that, by breaking the alliance that had moved the country to the left in the Great Depression, you cleared the way for capitalism in the United States to become the leading edge of an attack on the working class, which is what it has been doing. That's what's crushing all of these political parties. That's what's crushing the labor movement in this country accomplished. And this was done and it was done effectively. The Republicans took the lead. They were closest to the business community. The Democrats 
hesitated. They were, after all, the party of the working class. That's what they said. That's how they kept the working class's anger from becoming anti-systemic. They would represent the party, uh, the working class, as indeed would the president, Mr. Roosevelt. But they proved unable to do it. As the Republicans and the party undid the New Deal, the Democrats sat there. They could not take it further. They couldn't even protect what the left had accomplished in the 1930s. Step by step, they let it go. And they continue to do that to this day. I will give you only one example. The minimum wage in the United States at the federal level continues to be $7.25 per hour. That's not a livable wage. The last time it was raised to $7.25 an hour was in the year 2009. We have had rising prices, inflation, every single year since 2009. In other words, every year you would have had to raise the minimum wage just to allow workers to buy the same stuff in a second or third year that they were able to buy in the first year. And in this last year, this year we are talking about, we all know that the average prices have been going up 8 or 9%. And still, with a government, with a Democratic Party has the presidency, the Democratic Party has the Congress, uh, both houses, nothing is done about the minimum wage. You are savaging the poorest people in the community by not giving them any way to cope with the inflation your broken capitalism is imposing on everyone. And now it has come to a head. And the last two and a half years are that head. First, the COVID, a virus for which the country was unprepared, a virus which it could not manage to cope with. That's why the United States has over a million dead people from COVID, a number absolutely astonishing when you compare it, for example, to the People's Republic of China, which is the big comparison made around the world. China has a population four times that of the United States, and it says it has roughly 20,000 dead, not a million, 20,000, a number confirmed by the World Health Organization and several private monitoring institutions, including Johns Hopkins University, etc. What is going on? At the same time that we fail to cope as a nation with a virus, having had viruses before, we had another economic crash, second only to the Great Depression of the 1930s. We weren't prepared for that either. The working class of the United States, therefore, was put through the worst public health disaster in its history at the same time as the worst economic crash in its history. My goodness. And before those two years, 2020 and 2021, of those two together disasters, before that was done, we hit our working class with an inflation. And we are now speaking in our financial press of the raising of interest rates that is being undertaken to cope with the inflation that emerged from the failure to handle the crash and the COVID. This is a capitalist system careening around from one crisis to another. And here's the important point about it. The mass of the people know it. That's why they say things like everything's falling apart. If you stop at a gas station and fill up your car with gas, the man or woman in the car next to you makes a joke about how you're going to have to take out a second mortgage on your house to fill your car. Ha, ha, ha. Everybody's laughing. Nobody's laughing. As the American working class loses all that was gotten in the 1930s, its wages go nowhere anymore. 
especially since the 1970s. So how does the standard of living keep going up? You, you say to the workers, we'll lend you the money. We're not raising your wages anymore. We're making more and more profit off you because we're computerizing and robotizing and artificial intelligence. So we're making a fortune. We're not going to raise your wages, but we're making so much money. Here's what we'll do instead of raising your wages. We're going to take some of the profit we get by ripping you off, by not paying you the higher wages, even though you're more productive every year than you were the year before. We will turn around and lend you some of the money we ripped off of you. That way, not only do we get the benefit of keeping your wages low, but you're going to have to pay us back and you're going to have to pay us interest between the time we lend you the money and when you pay us back. We're going to make even more money off of you. And the American working class, knowing not what to do, having no left wing to mobilize, says, oh, OK, I guess I'll have to borrow. I'll have to borrow from my home and my car and my credit card and my student getting an education. The American working class becomes very angry, deeply angry. It's being ripped off. It kind of knows it. It's losing all those government programs that saved it. It knows that, too. Now, for part of the population, there is an offset. And here comes the splits of America today. The offset is the Democratic Party, unable or unwilling to contest against the capitalists who become their donors, the dominant voice in the culture, the old progressive Roosevelt fading into forgotten history, the new Democrats, the center Democrats, the Clintons, the Obamas, all of that. They decide we got to give our people something, our workers, our African-Americans, our women, the people who really got to leg up in the 1930s from progressive politics. We got to give them something. So in the years since the 1970s, they got something. You know what they got? What they were demanding in the 1960s. We did get some, some amelioration of the racism in this culture, some amelioration of the sexism in the culture some recognition of the environmental issues of the culture. The Democratic Party became the party of all of those interests. It was a compensation, an offset, something that the left in America could focus on if, please, it wouldn't go near the issues of socialism and communism and the critique of capital. That had to be shut down. That was impermissible. That was the taboo. And much of the left in America fell for that. The issues of racism, sexism, environment are very important. They had been neglected. This was something you could focus on with your leftist impulse and grumble a little bit that you couldn't criticize capitalism, but you kind of knew that that was dangerous to do. So for a while, that worked. But you know... It couldn't continue to work because it was all a ruse. Whatever was done for women, for blacks, for environmentalists didn't change the basic dynamic in which the rich got richer and everybody else didn't. The inequality of the United States gets worse and worse across the 70s, 80s, 90s, and both of the decades of this century. It's unremitting. Capitalism moves on. And you can do your little left wing cultural activity. Just don't interfere with us. And you know, after a while, people catch on. Even the gullible left of America caught on. And that's why we now see two things. A progressive wing of the Democratic Party, which sees it and fights it. Not enough, but they do. We have people who are called socialists winning elections and having a position inside that party and pushing. We all saw what Bernie did. We all saw what AOC is doing and so on. We also have even more important, a sudden explosion of a labor movement, a militant labor movement, unionizing, striking. Starbucks 
is not the union free enterprise it boasted it was, nor is Amazon, nor are fill in the blank. Workers are figuring out, yeah, I might be this, I might be that, but I'm a worker and I need to be protected against a system that is not taking care of me. It didn't take care of me with COVID. It didn't take care of me in the crash that came with COVID. It's not taking care of me with the inflation. I better join a union. I got nothing else. And you know what won't be far behind a revived socialist, communist, and other left-wing parties? Because the unions by themselves can't do it. And they are learning. They're seeing now the importance in their unionizing and striking efforts of the community support they can develop. But I want to also turn to you not only about the split inside the Democratic Party, but the split over on the other side. Here's what happened to the other part of the working class. The other part not only saw that the benefits they got in the New Deal were being taken away from them in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and the whole 75 years since the end of World War II, but they reacted by also noticing correctly that the cultural shift in America was toward multiculturalism, multiracialism, women being finally lifted up through their own efforts from the subordinate secondary position they had been put into. And these people were horrified. It meant that not only was their economic well-being being taken from them, but so were all the cultural realities they had come to rely on. All the people who prided themselves that maybe they were this and they were that, but they were at least white, or they were at least male, or they had some place in that old culture that had taught them it's good to be white. It's better to be white than not to be, and on and on. So we developed in this country the left wing into anti-racism, anti-sexism, environmentalism, but a right wing that wanted to reestablish the good old days economically by having a job that was secure with benefits. They never got that. They couldn't get it. It was not there. And you know what happened to them? Because they could not get economic restitution because they could not reverse their decline economically. They became all the more, here we go now, enraged about the denial of their culture, their culture of patriotism, their culture of white supremacy, their culture of religious fundamentalism. In an ironic twist, the reaction to capitalism's predations in the last 75 years produces the majority of the Supreme Court today. They want to take the country back. They are Mr. Trump's court, MAGA. Make America good in their view again. None of them faces the economic catastrophe capitalism has worked on this country. So instead, the country splits apart into red and blue states, into those who allow and favor abortion and those who want to stop it, those who don't want a limitation on religion. They want religion everywhere. They want to have the culture if they can't have the economic security. Culture is the war place, but capitalism is the war. It's fought out in these cultural splits. And like the war in Ukraine and like the fight between the United States and Russia, it can end the world. Here's the irony that an editorial in a European newspaper the other day caught. It, it read like this. The world is wondering whether the war in Ukraine will cause the split up 
of Russia. And the newspaper said, wrong question. Question should be, will the war in Ukraine be the last stage in the split up of the United States? And if you think about it, you will wonder. You should. The polls in Russia show Mr. Putin is very popular. The number two party in, in Russia after Mr. Putin's party is, for those of you who don't know, the Russian Communist Party. They agree with Mr. Putin and have said so on the war in Ukraine. There is no split inside Russia comparable to the splits we have here inside the United States. And under no circumstances should anyone imagine that this country hangs on the outcome of a war in Ukraine about which most Americans do not care. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but they don't. They just don't. They have too much else that has been piled on them and the polls make it crystal clear. The splitting of society on one hand is always a shock. The splitting of a country, the splitting of a region, the splitting of an alliance. And typically before the splits happen, you will often see tremendous efforts to insist by all the parties about to split that splitting is the last thing on their mind. They're more unified than ever. The government that falls on Thursday was boasting how solid it was Tuesday beforehand. Boris Johnson was assuring everyone he'd be prime minister indefinitely. He's gone. Mr. Macron said it was a new day in France for his political party. He's about to go. Mr. Trump was sure he won the election he didn't win. He's still sure. The effort to build up NATO doesn't solve the problem. Nothing I have gone over today solves the problem. Capitalism is a system built on maximizing profit. Everything is done by each capitalist, whether private or state, to maximize profit, to use the profit to grow, to grab more market share, to make more profit, and so on. The side effects ramify throughout the politics and the culture. Most of the time, the capitalists can manage those ramifications so that they work to reinforce the system. Until they can't anymore, until the contradictions inside the system mean that the very nationalism they use to deflect people's criticisms of capitalism comes back and makes it impossible for them to unify with other capitalists to get rid of the national difference so that they can survive. They can't handle the contradictions. They just can't. Britain left Europe with Brexit. Did that bring to Europe prosperity? Not at all. Did it solve the problems of British business? Not at all. Mr. Trump said he was going to bring back manufacturing. He didn't. Mr. Biden said he's going to. He didn't either. There's reasons that they can't do it. And those reasons have to do with a split between a capitalist system that does not want to let go and the political and cultural consequences that threaten that capitalism, but they don't know what else to do. They have designed and supported and funded the consequences of their own system to produce what is now threatening their own system. If they don't fund it, their system is unsupported. If they do fund these things, their system is threatened. That's the end. There's no which way to turn. And a desperate rearming of Germany, which has been done as a side effect of the war in Ukraine. A desperate assault 
on Russia, which is bringing the Russian alliance with China and with the BRICS and with much of the world into a much sharper focus. This was never the intent. These are effects that are unintended consequences that are opposite to what this war was intended to achieve. It will be painful to withdraw from this war, just as it was so painful to delay the withdrawal from Afghanistan that everybody who paid attention knew was the only way out. But they couldn't. And the lost opportunities and the lost support is showing up in a world which looks at this Ukraine war radically differently from the way most Americans are treated uh, in terms of what is told to them and what is not. Last point for today. For much of the last 20 or 30 years, the stock market has been the fun place of capitalism, almost the only place to point to where a kind of broad-based explosion of good news could be counted on. And there should be no surprise. As wages were attacked over these last 40, 50 years, as wages stopped rising, as companies replaced workers with machines, as companies moved production from high-wage to low-wage areas, as all of the protections of the New Deal were chipped away, less and less money had to be paid by corporations to their workers, less and less money had to be paid by corporations to the government. They escaped the wage cost, they escaped the taxes, and so they gathered more and more profits, and the stock market went up. When the economy coughed and sputtered, and let's remember it crashed in 2000, it crashed in 2008, it crashed again in 2020. Capitalism is a very unstable economic system. When that happened, they flooded the economy, this anxious government with money, printing it, simply creating it out of nothing. And that money went to the stock market which was where the action was happening, and bought shares and sold them at a higher price. So it went up and up and up until the prices of stocks were so disconnected from the actual business that the stock was a share of that the people engaged in this practice, using borrowed money from the government at zero interest to speculate forever, stopped doing it. They got afraid that the stock they would buy now wouldn't have what it did over the last 20 years, a roaring up. It might have a roaring down. And so the stock market, too, over this year, the first half of 2022, has gone nowhere, mostly down by a lot, because everyone's afraid that that hustle, keeping that part of the economy going, which made the top 10% happy because those are the ones that own shares, and the rest of America wondering, how come I hear on the press all the time that the economy is doing well? I'm not. Is there something wrong with me? That was the hope of this system. Blame yourself. But more and more with the strikes in the unions and the growing left, there's an alternative story. And this presentation today is part of that alternative story whose whole point and purpose is to change the system by seeing how the splits teach us as they fragment this system where its weak points are, where its issues of vulnerability lie, where the movements are that if we support and encourage and strengthen them, can turn the splitting and the breaking down of an old world into a much better new one. But in order to do that, we cannot lose sight of what the taboo kept away from us for the last 75 years. Organizing your economy with a tiny group of people at the top, owners, shareholders, boards of directors who tell the vast majority what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the profits. 
That is a system that will always do what it is doing to us now. We will not solve the problems until we have the courage to say, this is a system that also has to be questioned. Because maybe the only solution is to get a different system. Masters and slaves eventually face that situation, which is why we don't have slavery anymore. Lords and serfs eventually had to face that problem, and we don't have feudalism anymore. It's time for employers and employees, one or the other or both, to face the reality that the time for capitalism has come, has peaked, and is now fading. And that has to be dealt with because the pretense that you can evade and avoid it is crashing down around us in ways that make us say, the world is a scary place coming to an end. I'm worried. Dear friends, I hope you find this kind of presentation interesting. If you do, let me ask you, please, share it with your friends, your co-workers, others. It's an important way to extend our reach. It's an important way to shape or to help shape the conversation in this country out of which real change can and will come. And of course, if you can help us financially, that will help also do the kind of political organizing work that all of this is aimed to achieve. Thank you.